February 2nd, 2022, Mount Juliet, Tennessee. Right-wing extremist pastor Greg Locke, known for his social media screeds opposing transgender rights and COVID precautions, and for latching onto QAnon conspiracy theories, decided to hold an evening event with his congregation outside this church. These churchgoers were to bring books such as Harry Potter and Twilight that they feel promote witchcraft as well as other materials such as tarot cards, healing crystals, and Ouija boards that they view as anti-biblical and antichrist. Then they threw the books and other materials into a large bonfire, praying and celebrating while it all burned. Burning books tends to be a major marker, a huge red flag on the road to a totalitarian fascist state. After all, the Nazi regime burned books in the early 1930s during their rise to power in Germany, focusing these book-burning events on works written by Jewish authors and books they otherwise deemed anti-Aryan. While on its surface, the Tennessee event seemed like some fringe stunt pulled off by some crazy cult leader, it's a manifestation of the direction the GOP has been trending in for quite some time. In Spotsylvania County, Virginia, the county school board voted 6-0 back in November to ban two books from school libraries in their district that they deemed to be sexually explicit. These books were Call Me By Your Name, a novel by Andre Asaman about a same-sex romance, and 33 Snowfish, a book written by Adam Rapp about the difficult lives of three homeless adolescents. Two of the board members called for the banned books to be burned. A Facebook group consisting of those supporting the ban sought to dox full names and workplaces of educators and others who had spoken out against the ban during school board meetings and scheduled a book burning event where parents could bring books they found objectionable to be burned. Ultimately, the book burning was canceled due to fire regulations and the ban was rescinded about a week and a half later. While conservative thought leaders and celebrities with regressive views and behaviors decry the supposed rise of cancel culture, the real cancel culture is happening at church assemblies and school board meetings and state legislatures. The fact is, what is being canceled isn't just individual people, it isn't simply opinion. What is being canceled is truth. I am your host, Jay Poole. And this is Potstir Podcast. Welcome to Potstir Podcast, where politics, religion, and history collide, and it's not always polite. Can you believe it? This is episode 100, and the fact that Potstir Podcast is at this milestone is absolutely amazing to me. Before we begin, I want to thank you all from the bottom of my heart for listening. Whether you've been here since the beginning, this is your first episode, or you jumped on board this train at any point in between, I truly, truly appreciate you. In 2017, I started Potstir Podcast with the intent of creating a platform to discuss topics and issues I'm passionate about, and to share stories that make the facts and realities of politics and related topics resonate and feel true to life. And the past five years have been absolutely amazing. The journey has been more fulfilling and enriching than I ever expected. So here's to the first 100 episodes. And God willing, may there be another 100 and beyond. Now, let's talk about this week's topic. I'm not going to lie. I've been wanting to cover the topic of cancel culture for quite a while now. Like a lot of concepts promoted and vilified by America's political and religious right, cancel culture is a simple phrase, but when you dig beneath the surface, there's a lot more to it. And as I'll get into today, it's really a concept where this simple phrase doesn't do it justice. 
and that when we explore it more in depth, it touches on other ideas and realities. So this feels like the perfect subject for episode 100. Before we get into the meat of what cancel culture looks like, let's try to define what it means to cancel someone or something. Those who have latched onto cancel culture as a mantra are notoriously bad at defining terms like this. And the reason is, is that like other terms like woke and defund the police, cancel culture is a term with roots in the black community, but it's been co-opted by mainstream white America and later twisted and weaponized by conservatives to use against, guess who? Black Americans. Of course, not just black people, pretty much anyone who has less social influence, people of color, the LGBTQ plus community, the impoverished, minority religions, and secular people, and other marginalized folks. But it's a pattern. It's a distinct pattern. Terms that have meaning within marginalized communities find their way into the mouths of the mainstream, then conservatives, who then play up the fear factor that comes from knowing the term came from these scary marginalized communities without properly defining the term in question. We don't have to define woke. We don't have to expound on defund the police. We don't need to explain cancel culture. We simply have to play up the otherness of the idea to make it as scary as possible. And the goal is very simple. Weaponize terms for marginalized communities in order to invalidate those communities and their voices. The idea of canceling someone, from what I've been able to discover in the research, originally came from funk and disco music. Musician, songwriter, and producer Niall Rogers, who co-founded the 70s and 80s funk and disco group Chic, wrote the song Your Love is Cancelled, which was part of Chic's 1981 album Take It Off. Rogers' account of how the song came about can help us understand how the term was originally used in slang. Rogers recounted a date he went on in 1980. He and his female date went out to a club with some of his friends, including Eddie Murphy and the late Rick James. While at the club, Rogers' date asked the maitre d' to move another group from a table so their group could sit there. As someone who had not forgotten his humble roots, it really rubbed Rogers the wrong way. In an interview with the Washington Post, Rogers said, quote, she probably felt like she was rolling with Barry Gordy or something. I was just this lucky musician who was doing the job that I loved and got a hit record. And I was in my environment with all my good friends, end quote. When reflecting on this date's attempt to use his fame to order around other people, he said that even at the time, he saw this behavior as a deal breaker. He went on to say, quote, no, 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 I don't do that. I don't play that card, end quote. This experience inspired him to write, Your Love is Cancelled. To cancel in the context of the song meant to stop associating with another person for behavior viewed as unacceptable, similar to the cancellation of a TV series. While Your Love is Cancelled was a bit of a deep cut for the band and the song wasn't a mainstream hit, the term gained currency in the black community and was found from time to time in other works, most notably in the 1991 movie New Jack City, which in turn inspired lyrics in later songs, such as the 2005 50 Cent song Hustler's Ambition from the album Get Rich or Die Tryin', and the song Single originally released on the 2009 Lil Wayne mixtape No Ceilings. So the idea of canceling people was floating around the black community for at least a good 30, 30 plus years before it made its way onto Twitter in the early 2010s. But even then, to cancel someone meant making an individual choice to cut ties from ending relationships in real life to ending support of certain celebrities and other influential people for reasons important to the Twitter user. It wasn't really about wielding political or social power because most of the people doing the canceling didn't have a lot of influence. But like a lot of things that end up on Twitter, 
the term went from being understood in the context of the Black community to being used by a much wider audience. And with that crossover to a wider audience, the usage of cancel morphed from expressing being done with an ex or dropping a band you used to enjoy until they went corporate to using your voice on Twitter and other forms of social media to achieve a desired result, particularly from governments, organizations, and private companies. It's here where the term cancel culture as we know it came about. But as cancel culture, also known as call-out culture, consequence culture, or X is over party, became mainstream, the term cancel culture has come to symbolize several different phenomena. And in this episode, I think the best way to discuss cancel culture is to break it down into who or what is being canceled. Let's start with the canceling of famous individuals. When we think of canceling famous people, it's generally that someone famous or influential says or does something a segment of the public views as deeply problematic, and they want to see them deplatformed. The offended segment of the public wants to see them lose their contracts, lose book deals, lose their jobs. Most recently in the news, there have been controversies surrounding UFC commentator and podcaster Joe Rogan and actress, comedian, and The View co-host Whoopi Goldberg. Joe Rogan, who has a multi-million dollar exclusivity deal with Spotify, was criticized on social media for spreading misinformation regarding the COVID-19 virus and later for using the hard R N-word on older podcast episodes, to the point that several musical artists walked away from Spotify, either temporarily or permanently. Despite this, Spotify has chosen to stick by Rogan, claiming free speech. Though they have taken down over 100 episodes in his back catalog that may have contained some of the offending content. On a recent episode of The View, While discussing the banning of the graphic novel, Mouse, which I'll discuss in more detail later in this episode, Whoopi Goldberg said that the Holocaust, quote, is not about race, it's about man's inhumanity to man. These are two white groups of people, end quote. This statement, one that was also reiterated in a guest spot on The Late Show with Stephen Colbert, was widely criticized by Jewish advocacy groups such as the Anti-Defamation League and the Holocaust Museum, and led to Goldberg incurring a two-week suspension from The View. But these aren't the only celebrities that have faced public criticism over something they've said or done. Author J.K. Rowling and comedian Dave Chappelle have both been criticized for statements considered to be anti-trans. NFL quarterback Aaron Rodgers was raked over the coals in social media for lying about his vaccination status, and so on. While cases can be made for cancel culture having unequal effects based on whether or not the offending celebrity is contrite or due to their racial, cultural, or gender identity, I would argue that whether or not the canceling of a celebrity is successful and to what degree is based primarily on who they offend. In general, if the celebrity deeply offends their core audience, the canceling tends to have a stronger effect than if the celebrity offends a segment of the population that is not their target audience. Between the late 2000s and mid-2010s, R&B artist Chrisette Michelle was a hot name in music, and a lot of established hip-hop artists wanted to work with her. In her early career, she provided guest vocals on tracks from artists such as Jay-Z, Nas, The Game, and Ghostface Killa, and also became successful in her own right with her song Epiphany hitting number one on the Billboard 200 chart in 2008 and winning a Grammy in 2009 for her song Be OK. Chrisette Michelle also started venturing into television, recording a track for Tyler Perry's House of Pain and guest starring on the show Girlfriends. Later, in the early and mid-2010s, she would continue to make hit records and collaborate with artists such as 2 Chains and Wale. In addition, she joined the cast of the reality TV show R&B Divas Los Angeles for seasons 2 and 3. Everything was going quite well for Chrisette Michelle. 
was. In 2017, when Donald Trump was elected president, his team sought out Chrisette Michelle to perform at his inaugural ball. While Trump has had a decades-long history of racism, including against black people, and it didn't magically stop in 2017, the visual of having a token black person performing for him was enough for them to pay good money for. Against the advice of just about everyone in her life, including her husband, she agreed. She would sing a song for $75,000 at one of the inaugural balls. She didn't shake Trump's hand or even meet him, but she said she did it to unite the country. The thing is, it's a bit difficult to unite with a leader who has no interest in uniting with us. The backlash was swift. Chrisette Michelle was skewered on social media. Spike Lee, who had previously wanted to use one of her songs in his Netflix series, publicly reneged. Her label dropped her. Many of her fans became former fans and stopped attending her concerts. She endured death threats, which are never okay. While she still performs, her career is nowhere near where it once was. Many people, herself included, compare her fall from grace to Kanye West, who joined forces with Donald Trump during his occupation of the White House. And see, Kanye went even harder core than Chrisette Michelle. Kanye wore a MAGA hat, he met with Trump, he co-signed some of his lies, he even had the audacity to say that slavery was a choice. And while there was some backlash, he has continued to enjoy his career, virtually unscathed. And while some might say Kanye's simping for Trump was okay because it opened the door for his then-wife Kim Kardashian to advocate on behalf of a few unjustly incarcerated black folks, does that make what he did any better? Don't get me wrong, it's great that Kim's advocacy led to the release of unjustly incarcerated people, and I'm sure they and their families are grateful. But did that fix the baked-in, ingrained systemic racial and economic disparities in the criminal justice system that led to the injustice these people faced and encountered in the first place? Hell no! Trump released a few black prisoners while advancing the propaganda claim that systemic racism is a leftist myth to make white people feel bad. Chrisette Michelle, and to be fair, a lot of people, believe that her career failed and Kanye's didn't due to her gender and her outspoken Christian faith. I don't buy that being a Christian in and of itself was the problem, but I'm not particularly shocked that she made it about that. Now, did her gender matter? On some level, a case can be made for that. Within the black community, the expectations for black women to stay loyal to the community are stronger than the expectations for black men. But I would also argue that who their audiences were and where they were in their careers at the time of their brushes with Trump made a huge difference as well. Kanye West was already solidly mainstream. Years before, he had crossed over from a favorite of the black community to a much wider audience. Hip hop as a genre has its roots in the black community, and most of the artists are still black. But the audience doesn't completely reflect that. 70% of rap music consumers are suburban, middle class white people. Now, of course, it doesn't mean that every rap and hip hop artist has a mostly white audience, but when you cross over like Kanye, your audience changes. As for Chrisette Michelle, while she won a Grammy, it was for Best Urban Alternative Performance, which is a fairly niche category. She primarily worked with artists and entertainment moguls whose primary audience is Black, and her own audience was primarily Black. That does not diminish her talent or how big a deal she was prior to her cancellation. But the point is, the audience she was answering to is not the same as the one Kanye was answering to. Ultimately, the target audience is what matters. This is how Fox News shills like Howard Kurtz get away with releasing bullshit pieces about how cancel culture 
is destroying Joe Rogan, while Whoopi Goldberg, an outspoken Democrat, is defended. Saying this with a straight face, while Whoopi Goldberg has been suspended from her job, and Joe Rogan has been defended by his employer Spotify in 4K. Joe Rogan's primary audience is men, particularly men like himself, the types of men who are more likely to agree with or at the very least tolerate his statements regarding COVID or his usage of the full-on N-word. Whoopi Goldberg's audience is not that kind of audience that on the whole approves of statements that are ahistorical and ignorant regarding the nature of the Holocaust. Adolf Hitler's ideology absolutely viewed Jews as a separate race. And for several centuries, at least prior to the Holocaust, Jews in Europe were perceived as a separate race and were targeted in anti-Semitic pogroms. This is why Aaron Rodgers, who endangered the lives of his colleagues and the public by lying about his vaccination status, was given MVP honors by the NFL just a week ago while former NFL quarterback Colin Kaepernick silently protested police brutality during the 2016 season and has since been kept out of the league. The NFL's primary fan base are Americans who believe that kneeling during a national anthem to protest violence against Black Americans is egregious, but exposing other people to a deadly virus is a legitimate excuse in freedom. Whether or not you get deplatformed has a lot to do with where your bread is buttered. And the deplatforming of celebrities is nothing new. It just wasn't called canceling, and it came primarily from the right. In the early 2000s, at the, after the September 11th attacks, President George W. Bush responded by sending troops to Afghanistan to wage what would later become a forever war that lasted two decades. Shortly after, his administration began spreading falsehoods to the international community, including the claim that Iraq had weapons of mass destruction. They also exaggerated the ties secularist Iraq had with the Salafist Islamic group Al-Qaeda as a pretext to wage war on Iraq and for baby Bush to wrap up what daddy Bush couldn't finish a decade earlier. While Bush was a Republican, U.S. House reps and senators from both major parties as well as the majority of the public, overwhelmingly supported the war, since W. was writing on the goodwill he received after 9-11. In addition to much of the international community, there were a few Americans who questioned the pretense for going into Iraq and were opposed to the Iraq war at the time, but these anti-war Americans were usually labeled unpatriotic and pro-terrorist. In 2003, Music from the country music band The Dixie Chicks, now called The Chicks, were removed from country music stations across the country because lead singer Natalie Maines said during a concert in the UK, quote, Just so you know, we're on the good side with y'all. We do not want this war, this violence, and we're ashamed that the President of the United States is from Texas, end quote. While European fans cheered Maines' pronouncement, the core fan base, conservatives from middle America, did not appreciate this and responded by calling for the chicks to be deplatformed. With a few exceptions, cancel culture's effect on celebrities is fairly minimal, even if they lose contracts or jobs. Most targets of deplatforming are well off enough that at the end of the day, a momentary hit to their reputation or bottom line is not a huge deal. J.K. Rowling is fine despite her cries of turf victimhood. Dave Chappelle has made controversial moves before and has been fine, and he will continue to be fine. Aaron Rodgers is fine, despite claiming that he's been silenced when talking to ESPN. And you know what? Both Whoopi Goldberg and Joe Rogan will be just fine. The important thing here is that regardless of what side of the aisle you're on, as a celebrity, you are not owed patrons and fans are not obligated to stick by you unconditionally. But what about private businesses, organizations, nonprofits, and the like? If they're the target of canceling, will they be okay? Well, it depends. But generally, yes. When we talk about the canceling of businesses, also known as boycotts, the goal is typically for the business to feel enough financial and social pain 
to make certain changes that the offended segment will approve of. In recent years, Hobby Lobby and Chick-fil-A, both companies run by evangelical Christians, have been targeted on social media for boycotts due to anti-gay and anti-abortion advocacy, and especially in the case of Hobby Lobby, store policies that advance these agendas. Hobby Lobby also has a history of buying stolen and pilfered artifacts that belong to developing countries and communities of color. Not great. But both companies have continued to thrive in spite of, or perhaps in the case of Chick-fil-A, because of the backlash. Because these segments of the population who, because the segment of the population who finds their behavior problematic enough to stop going are, by and large, not their core consumers. Starbucks has also been a fairly frequent target of boycotts from both sides. Some on social media have targeted Starbucks for the past several years as a supposed agent of the war on Christmas because of their lack of explicit Christmas imagery on their winter holiday-themed cups. Others came for Starbucks due to a 2018 racial profiling incident caught on video where two black men were arrested in one of their Philadelphia stores after being denied use of the public restroom. The backlash over the racial bias incident resulted in racial bias training at all U.S. Starbucks locations and Starbucks changing their policies so that any member of the public could use the restroom regardless of purchase. Like deplatforming, boycotting is nothing new. It has a very long history in the United States, most notably in the civil rights movement but the right has also pushed for boycotts. Large conservative Christian advocacy groups, such as the American Family Association and the Family Research Council, have been calling for boycotts of large businesses from Disney to Procter & Gamble for decades due to company policies inclusive of LGBTQ plus people. These groups have also focused on government lobbying against same-sex marriage, people who are transgender using the bathrooms of their actual gender, LGBTQ plus adoption, and legalized abortion, and have spread a lot of harmful anti-gay and anti-trans lies and propaganda. But what about small businesses? Negative experiences at small businesses are easily recounted and spread through customer reviews on social media platforms such as Facebook and Twitter, as well as business-specific apps like Yelp. Some of these reviews touch on basic bad service or bad product, while others delve into issues of alleged discrimination. And now with the pandemic, complaints also include whether or not a business enforces the wearing of masks, as well as business owners posting signs or job listings, or writing social media posts, shaming the labor pool and government handouts to justify short staffing. All while these businesses received PPP loans they weren't made to pay back. While, of course, these complaints also are waged against larger businesses, small businesses feel the effects of this more. Now, many social media savvy business owners and managers try to react swiftly to negative feedback, either apologizing and attempting to defuse the negative situation or outright refuting the allegations. You'll even hear accounts of business owners going into DMs or otherwise trying to contact customers directly to pressure them to take down negative reviews. It can be argued, though, that larger and well-established businesses are able to endure the effects of boycotting without major changes, but small businesses can't endure in the same way. Theoretically, that argument can be made. After all, half of small businesses fail within the first five years, and that was pre-COVID. The pandemic hasn't helped those numbers. But if a small business is canceled, Will it go under specifically because of that? It's hard to say because, at least as far as I'm aware, empirical data isn't available that will speak to this. I would imagine that a brigade of bad reviews, in general, can have an adverse effect on a small business's bottom line, but at the same time, it also depends, probably. Especially given the nature of the company, the complaints involved, and the community where the small business is located. For example, If customers complain that none of a store's staff wears masks and they don't enforce masks and social distancing mandates on clientele, but the community where the business is located is heavily anti-mask 
and anti-COVID precautions, then such negative reviews may have no real effect on the business's bottom line and they may not feel compelled to change their policies. Similarly, if a business receives a lot of complaints, but it's in an industry where a lot of complaints are common, such as law firms, or if the business performs a niche function where there aren't really any local competitors, such as the only mechanic in a 50-mile radius, that business may not feel any adverse effects if they ignore consumer complaints or double down on existing practices. But this is only speculation based on anecdotal evidence, since, as I've mentioned, I'm not aware of data that addresses the effects of cancel culture in small businesses. The bottom line when it comes to private companies and cancel culture is that as consumers, we can choose what companies we give our money to. This also applies to organizations, nonprofits, religious organizations, secular charities, political action committees, interest groups, and so on. As consumers in a capitalist society, we have the freedom to make choices, and those choices can be made for any reasons that are important to us. For example, I choose not to eat at Waffle House due to several instances of mistreatment of their black customers and the company's unwillingness to properly address the problem. Do I think my personal choice not to eat there makes any dent in Waffle House's bottom line? Not at all. I'm sure they don't care, but it's a personal choice not to use my hard-earned money to support a business that does not value my patronage and that of people like myself. And that's just as valid a choice as the person who chooses not to shop at Hobby Lobby for not offering birth control to their employees, or someone who chooses not to shop at Dick's Sporting Goods because they stopped selling semi-automatic firearms after the Parkland shooting. When talking about the Great Resignation in previous episodes, I have said that companies are not entitled to labor. It's the same with customers. If people choose not to buy your product or use your service for reasons, that's their right to do so. I get why the entitlement mentality exists when it comes to companies in the U.S. In our capitalist system, business owners are highly praised. They're lauded as job creators. Laws are passed by Congress and signed into law by each president, regardless of party, that benefits corporations to a greater degree than what is seen in a lot of Western countries. Yet even that is often not enough. Used this way, cancel culture implies that as a business, you're somehow owed customers simply because you provide a service or offer a certain selection of products, and that the choice of consumers not to use your service is inherently an injustice. That is wrong. That's not how it works. Just like companies are not entitled to employees, companies are not entitled to customers. As a Xennial, someone who was born in the years that straddled the end of Generation X and the beginning of the Millennials, I distinctly remember when technology wasn't what it is now but was advancing very quickly. In high school, only two of my friends had cell phones. These cell phones were just that, phones. And these were durable Nokia bricks. The person on the other end using a landline would hear you along with a varying amount of static. And if you roamed, meaning your phone was hitting the tower for a different cell phone company, the already high price of cell phone service would be even higher. As for the internet, that wasn't on our phones. That was on computers and only on computers. We had dial up, so it meant that the computer had to essentially call for internet service and we would get it through the phone line. This internet was incredibly slow. Imagine it taking several minutes to download a small picture and hours to download one song. You may have to wait overnight for that song to download. And streaming? <laughs> streaming, that's a joke. We did have bulletin boards and message services like AIM and ICQ. And if you wanted to go anywhere, you could call wherever you were going and get directions depending on what part of town you were coming from. You could use actual fold-out maps, the kind you would get at a bookstore, or you could get maps from the internet from services like MapQuest. You would print it out on actual paper, 
and then follow the map and maybe get to where you're going. In GPS, researchers were still in the middle of testing it out, so most people didn't know this technology existed yet. It was truly a different world. Nowadays, everything is at our fingertips. While this device most of us in the West have is called a smartphone, it does more than just call people. It's a phone, pager, computer, GPS, Walkman, camera, camcorder, video player, gaming system, calendar, alarm, and more. And instead of needing to own a bunch of devices, we can have virtually everything needed for life in the palms of our hands. Because of this, and other advances in technology such as high-speed internet and Wi-Fi, the world is closer to us than ever before. We can see and hear all manner of phenomena and happenings all around the globe that might not have been accessible to us. After all, broadcast media has always chosen what they will and won't record, what they will and won't report, based on what media execs think is important. But now, we can record whatever we want based on what we ourselves think is important and post it on social media. While there are still economic disparities in technology access, by and large, these advancements have democratized the flow of information. There are pros and cons to this. Mainly, more information is available, but also more misinformation is available. But specifically as it relates to this episode, instead of simply being told about discrimination, harassment, and bias due to characteristics such as sexual orientation, gender identity, race, or ethnicity, we are able to observe these harsh realities in living color. Can't say it didn't happen the way they said it happened when it's caught on video. In the past several years, with both the rise of smartphones that can record video and the rise of social media platforms like Facebook and Twitter, there's been a proliferation of videos posted that display bad behavior by members of the public. Sometimes it's people going to stores and harassing employees and management because they feel wronged in some way, or these stores have mask or vaccination policies consumers don't like. Sometimes it's harassment, profiling and targeting of people of color, immigrants, and other marginalized people. Not by police, not by celebrities, but by regular everyday people. Sometimes these are xenophobic, homophobic, transphobic, or racist tirades in public places against store employees or other customers. Sometimes these are calls made to police for <clears throat> swimming while black, barbecuing while black, bird watching while black, camping while black, shopping while black, mowing while black. And every single one of those I mentioned are based on legitimate real incidents. Feel free to Google them. Sometimes these are angry folks accosting others for perceived slights, assuming they're undocumented due to their apparent ethnicity and threatening to turn them into ICE. And either bystanders to these incidents or the targets themselves, and once in a while the perpetrators, will upload a video to some social media outlet. So when these videos go viral, they get watched by bunches of people, thousands, perhaps millions of people, and many people are shocked horrified, upset, angry. And unlike watching a movie or a TV series where eventually the bad guy gets their comeuppance, there doesn't seem to be any for the perpetrators in these videos. These folks visit upon their targets a range of emotions from annoyance to terror. And then that's it. Perhaps a crowd forms and tells the harasser to go away. Sometimes the police show up and anything could happen to the targets, from separating people to defuse the situation to shooting the target of the profiling call. But regardless of what happens to the target, the perpetrator usually fades into the faceless masses. And it leaves those who watch the videos with a profound sense of injustice. So with the seemingly vague phrase that carries a very specific meaning, Twitter, do your thing. Viewers often become vigilantes in their own right, seeking out the identity of the stranger harassing another member of the public. And then once they have that person's identity, calling their landlord, calling their job, posting negative reviews of their company on Google or on Yelp, essentially going on their own campaign of harassment 
so that the person who did that horrible thing on video can finally get what's coming due. That type of cancel culture can get into very dicey territory. And honestly, I have my reservations about it. On one hand, many of the antagonists featured in these videos are not very sympathetic characters. Besides the emotional toll such profiling and harassment take on the victims, being a barbecue Betty, a permit patty, or coupon Carl can be extremely harmful, dangerous, or deadly even to those they set their sights on, especially when that action is calling the police or border patrol on someone who is simply minding their own business. Also, the concept of shame, while our society tends to frame it as a negative, can be a useful tool in limited circumstances. Whether we like it or not, not everyone will do the right thing for the right reasons. While we cannot control what people think or feel, nor should we, bigoted actions should be given no quarter. Behaving in a racist, homophobic, or otherwise bigoted way towards other people should be called out and shouldn't be socially acceptable in a civil society. And taking your anger out on low-wage workers who are limited in what they can do to rectify whatever your issue might be should not be considered okay either. In addition, there is a level of responsibility these perpetrators should accept for their behavior. There are cameras everywhere. Many businesses and government agencies have them, and most people carry them around with them. Anything you do, from the mundane to the outrageous, may be recorded at any time. Once we walk through our front doors and head outside, there is literally no expectation of privacy. None. But Jay, my freedom of speech. This is not a freedom of speech issue. Freedom of speech in the U.S. context specifically refers to our right to express our ideas, even if unpopular, without censorship or persecution from the government. Freedom of speech does not mean freedom from social consequences. And as a quick aside, when conservatives complain about cancel culture costing these people their jobs, believe it or not, job loss is not a consequence I'm thrilled about in most cases. But the issue isn't really cancel culture causing people to lose employment. The issue is at-will employment. The U.S. has some of the weakest labor protections among post-industrialized developed nations, and it shows when it comes to the employer-employee relationship. Under most circumstances, employment agreements are considered voluntary and can be broken by the employer or employee at any time. In practice, it's considered professional and in good form for an employee to give their place of employment two weeks' notice and there may be incentives and company guidelines to further encourage the custom of employees giving notice. But employers are not bound to those same expectations and can and often do let go of employees at any point without prior notice and for virtually any reason or no stated reason at all. Legally, you can't be fired for protected characteristics, but what isn't protected is public behavior that can reflect negatively on an employer. There is a case to be made for there being some kind of due process before firing people if they're recorded acting poorly and they get exposed and doxxed. But the answer isn't cynically blaming cancel culture for someone reaping negative consequences for their actions. The answer is to strengthen labor protections. But those who want to cry, cancel culture bad, because everyone on Facebook saw Joe Sixpack calling his neighbor the N-word, don't want to hear that. But on the other hand, Twitter, do your thing, as an approach to bad behavior caught on tape, has its own problems. First of all, once the internet has viewed the video, there's no control over what happens next. There have been a few cases where the wrong person was initially identified on social media. For example, in July of 2021, a video went viral of a racial confrontation in a Seattle restaurant between a white man and a black couple. Initially, the wrong man was identified as the aggressor in the video. The misidentified man received death threats, which, again, are never okay, regardless of if it's the right guy or not, as well as hundreds of phone calls, 
requests from local media to give statements, and the Yelp score for his home improvement business tanked from people leaving negative reviews claiming the man was racist. This person was made to deal with the wrath of the online mob, even though it simply was a case of mistaken identity. And even if the instigator is properly identified, how much is too much? Public criticism confined to Facebook, Twitter, or even TikTok? Protests in front of their homes or places of employment? Pressuring their employer to fire them? Direct harassment? Is a neighbor who is simply being nosy and not minding their own business just as deserving of being canceled as a passerby who calls the cops on an eight-year-old girl for selling water on a sidewalk while black? Should someone who is caught on camera screaming at a clerk because they put peanut butter in the smoothie they ordered lose their job? What if the person gives a heartfelt apology or shows with their actions that they've learned from what they've done? Is there any space for redemption? These are questions that we really need to consider. Second, mass vigilantism gives us an illusion of justice without addressing the root issues that lead to so many of these incidents and the resulting feeling of injustice when we watch them on our iPhones. If you notice, despite the social consequences attackers often receive from the masses, these incidents continue to happen, and they don't seem to be slowing down all that much, COVID notwithstanding. Is doxing and getting people fired really helping? In the grand scheme of things, probably not. Social consequences may make people's lives miserable, but it also hands these perpetrators their own shield of victimization. Some people see these viral videos inside with the instigators and feel that them being outed and facing internet consequences is unfair. It's the woke Twitter mob, cancel culture run amok, ruining their lives. Not the fact that the instigators of these confrontations chose to behave in a harassing or bigoted way toward other people to begin with. So what are the root issues leading to these incidents? Entitlement is a big problem in this country. There's a segment of our population that feels entitled to have everything go their way, especially as it relates to those with less power in our society. Of course, it's frustrating to go into the local Kroger and there's no boneless chicken and they're out of paper towels again. But does that mean we should feel entitled to go off on the clerk who's there working to survive just because the store is out of something we want? And let's not get started on the entitlement that comes from the portion of the U.S. population who feel they should be able to infect our entire country with a deadly virus because masks are uncomfortable and they're scared to get a fauci ouchy. And that entitlement extends to other aspects of daily life. Might you be slightly ticked when the little kid mowing the neighbor's lawn accidentally cuts a tiny bit of yours too during his latest pass-through? Sure. But it doesn't mean the kid should be accosted by police for trespassing because of that. And let's talk super, super briefly about our relationship with police. I delve into this a lot more in episode 77 in part one of my policing series. But relevant to this, when it comes to this episode, is that the role of modern policing is to provide a feeling of comfort and security to wealthy and middle-class white Americans by focusing their policing efforts on populations perceived to be threats, such as poor people, black people, brown people. Some segments of our population are protected and served, while others are policed. We're also told as a society to call the police if we ever get a tiny feeling something could be wrong, which can be based on our own internalized biases and prejudices. It's that whole, if you see something, say something, which feeds into surveillance culture. The result of these conditions is that you have too many people who think that if they're made to feel uncomfortable in any way, even if it's just the mere presence of the wrong kinds of folks, they feel that they can call the police and they'll make it all better. And they do it because a lot of times it's true. It's very rare that those who call the police under false pretenses or call the police on others who are not even breaking the law get arrested themselves and face criminal charges. 
We need to address the root causes that embolden members of the public to profile, harass, and weaponize law enforcement against others who are minding their own business or simply doing their jobs. If we properly dealt with this sense of entitlement and the use of police to enforce it, I truly believe that fewer people would act out this way, and in turn, there would be fewer Twitter mobs seeking to cancel so-called Karens and Chads out of a desire to right wrongs from the comfort of their gamer chairs. I also want to quickly touch on a couple of other things regarding cancel culture against individuals. As I mentioned, a lot of times people watch these viral videos and feel a sense of injustice, and so they participate in actions designed to ensure that perpetrators of these bad acts caught on video pay for what they've done. But in a sense, it can be a form of slacktivism. Participating in online social media mobs can be a way to feel like you're down for the cause without actually sticking your neck out on behalf of marginalized people who are targets of harassing and profiling behavior. How many people are quick to shoot an anonymous email to a stranger's employer, but are less willing to have conversations with their family members who share the same sentiments as those who are caught on video? How many of those retweeting these viral videos shaming bigoted instigators harbor similar prejudices themselves that remain unexamined. I'm sure many of you remember Amy Cooper, the white woman in New York who was recorded on viral video calling police on a black man birdwatching in Central Park and lied to dispatchers claiming he threatened her. Cooper wasn't a Trump supporter or even a Republican. She was a card-carrying liberal Democrat a demographic that often prides itself on being more enlightened and tolerant. And yet, in that moment, there wasn't anything distinguishing her from anyone else who has weaponized their privilege. When we see these videos and feel that wave of injustice, we need to go beyond the easy gestures and work towards meaningful change in both our public and private lives. So I've talked about common ways the term cancel culture is used, including acts such as deplatforming celebrities, boycotting companies, and publicly shaming private individuals. But there's another type of cancel culture that is most concerning from the perspective of freedom and cultivating a healthy democracy. This type of cancel culture is the act of censorship. The organized, systematic canceling of ideas, facts, and truth. On one hand, censorship, at least by the government, is by and large prohibited by the First Amendment. The First Amendment right to freedom of speech is intended to protect unpopular speech from government censorship and suppression. But in practice, some ideas have effectively been targeted by government. Within the past century, socialist and communist ideologies have been shunned as anti-American, even to the point of congressional hearings to root out suspected communists during the 1950s. Efforts were made, especially during the Cold War, to discredit labor unions and social movements such as the Civil Rights Movement by tying their leaders to communist ideologies. Whether or not these leaders actually were communist or socialist, in the grand scheme of things, it shouldn't really matter in a free society. But it did, and still does. Former or current Communist Party membership may still keep immigrants from obtaining U.S. citizenship, and the labels of communist and socialist are still attached to social movements such as Black Lives Matter as a means to discredit them. More recently, conservative politicians, pundits, and influencers have complained about cancel culture, especially the types that I've discussed targeting celebrities and companies they like, and private individuals engaged in behavior they support. But on the other hand, many of these same people have led, mobilized, and supported efforts in state legislatures, municipalities, and local school boards across the country to ban educational curricula, books, and policies that encourage racial, ethnic, and religious diversity, equity, and inclusion, the inclusion and normalization of LGBTQ plus people, and real accurate history and civics that includes the realities of racism, xenophobia, anti-Semitism, and other forms of bigotry. 
real, accurate information is being banned under the guise of so-called critical race theory. Those who are anti-critical race theory argue that it is fundamentally anti-white due to the focus on historical and contemporary racism against Black Americans, Native Americans, and other people of color, gives Black people a victimhood mentality, and makes white children feel guilty. In reality, critical race theory, an academic approach that focuses on the effects of systemic racism on the legal system and social institutions, is primarily taught in advanced law and graduate level social sciences, and even in those arenas, is a niche area of study. It does not assign blame to white people living today as individuals or even as a group for past injustices. And many critical race scholars would say that racial inequality can be perpetuated in social institutions without racist intent. So the idea that the theory is anti-white is factually false. The charge of black victimhood is a racist trope that tends to be thrown around a lot by conservatives when racism against black Americans is discussed. It's a way to blame black Americans for our own oppression while ignoring historical and contemporary racial realities or assigning responsibility for those realities on the so-called cultural deficiency of Black Americans. And as far as guilt among white children, it's strange that the folks who rail against safe spaces feel that their children are entitled to safe spaces that shield them from facts and truth. But besides that, the purpose of discussing the realities of historical and contemporary race relations is so that we can truly understand how we ended up in our current reality, and we can draw from that to forge a better way forward. The phrase critical race theory, also referred to as CRT, is being used as a scare term by conservatives to refer to the accurate and complete teaching of U.S. history and civics, including the realities of racism and adjacent forms of bigotry. But going forward in this episode, I will refer to what is being banned by what it truly is. Real History, True Civics. As of this recording, nine states have banned the teaching of accurate information regarding racism to public school students. Idaho, Oklahoma, Tennessee, Texas, Iowa, New Hampshire, South Carolina, Arizona, and North Dakota. In general, the legislation passed in these states banned discussion, training, and or orientation that the U.S. is inherently racist, and also prohibit discussions of conscious and unconscious bias, privilege, discrimination, and oppression. Some of this legislation also encompasses gender as well as race. Close to 20 additional states are working on similar legislation. In addition, local governments and school boards across the U.S. have seen a major uptick in requests from parents to ban books and other publications from school and municipal libraries, that discuss issues such as racism, anti-Semitism, xenophobia, sexism, and sexual violence, homophobia, transphobia, and the like. Some of these books also affirm LGBTQ plus identities and transmit positive messages to people of color and other marginalized people. Ostensibly, parents have sought to have books like the 1619 Project by Nicole Hannah-Jones, Melissa by Alex Gino, the children's adaptation of the Ibram X. Kendi book, Stamped, co-authored with Jason Reynolds, and All Boys Aren't Blue by George M. Johnson, banned from the classroom and from school libraries due to a grassroots groundswell of concern from parents about the teaching of concepts in the classroom that they either disapprove of or feel is not age-appropriate. The charge of age inappropriateness extends to the recounting of world historical events, such as the Holocaust. The McMinn County School Board in Tennessee voted unanimously to ban Mouse, a Pulitzer Prize-winning graphic novel about the Holocaust from its language arts curriculum because they felt it was too adult-oriented for their middle school students. Yet being in middle school didn't give anyone a pass from being murdered in the Holocaust. Let that sink in. I think it's important to point out here that the parental rights movement pushing for many of these book bans is not really a grassroots movement. 
it's being disseminated on a high level by national conservative orgs such as Moms for Liberty, No Left Turn in Education, and the Goldwater Institute. It doesn't mean these efforts are centralized per se, but a lot of these ideas are being spread to parents, either directly or indirectly, from national conservative interest groups and think tanks. Much like the banning of real history and civics from the classroom in many states, the banning of books is a very deliberate effort by right-wing leaders to withhold knowledge from the young, shrinking the world the next generation lives in. And these book bans are not just focusing on books that are designed to teach explicitly about racial equity and gender identity. These ban efforts also target books written by authors of color or about notable people of color, regardless of if these works specifically discuss racism. In Texas, Michelle Obama's autobiography and a children's book about Black Olympian Wilma Rudolph were recommended for banning. And Toni Morrison's classic novel, Beloved, was made into a political wedge issue leading to the election of Republican Glenn Youngkin to the Virginia governorship. The banning of books in order to exclude difficult topics invalidates the difficulties students may deal with in real life. It says to some students, those who don't fit the majority mold, that their experiences are not worthy of learning about or being shared. And it robs students of the political majority of learning about the experiences of people whose lives differ from their own, and therefore opportunities to develop empathy. It's also making the jobs of educators much more difficult, as teachers and administrators are under the gun and are in some cases being forced out of their jobs because they just might be teaching facts to students. Fortunately, there are parents, educators, librarians, and other members of the public who are pushing back against the banning of real history and civics as well as the anti-POC and anti-LGBTQ plus book ban campaigns. For national organizations such as the American Library Association and the National Coalition Against Censorship, to state level and local groups, people are being mobilized to fight back. We need to find ways to support them. Search out groups in your area, join them, contribute in any way you can, whether it's time, money, or simply amplifying their message. It's important to back them because knowledge is under attack. Now, setting aside for a moment the astroturfed nature of the pro book ban regressive parental rights movement for a moment, this idea of parental rights does bring up a fundamental question. To what degree should parents be in control of what their children learn? I'm going to take a pretty controversial position on this which is to say that parents have a responsibility to their children and for their children, but children are not owned by their parents. Children are autonomous, sentient beings. And this idea that children are possessions, objects, pawns, does a great deal of harm to children. It does a real disservice to them. And you don't have to like what I'm saying. I stand by this 100%. I'm saying this with my whole chest. And furthermore, to say that your kid is too young to learn about race, ethnicity, gender, violence, etc. is the height of privilege. A young Latina girl whose parents are whisked away by ICE can't opt out of her experiences as an immigrant of color because she's too young. The five-year-old black boy placed in handcuffs by police officers because of the color of his skin can't opt out of his racialized experience because he's too young. The kid who grows up around violence, the kid who grows up in extreme poverty and deprivation, or a kid who has been assaulted by adults or other children in their life, they cannot just opt out of those traumas because they're too young. Children being taught real-world concepts gives them the language to understand the diverse experiences of their peers, as well as articulate their own experiences should they find themselves in situations their parents are unable to shield them from or otherwise don't understand. But you know what? Let's be for real. It's really not about age appropriateness, is it? If you look at those who endorse modern book banning and want to keep true history, true civics, and principles of diversity 
equity and inclusion out of the classroom and those who want children to be taught the Bible. That Venn diagram is nearly one circle. If you actually read the Bible beyond a few well-placed verses, it is quite a violent book. Does it mean I don't enjoy and appreciate the Bible? No. Does it mean that as a Christian, I don't take the Bible seriously? No, I sure do. But part of the Bible's intrigue is its violence. Part of the Bible's relatability can be found in its violence. And there's a lot of evangelical and other right-wing Christians who are not honest about that. If you want to call the killings in the Bible, including the killings of babies and the sexual assaults and the torture and all manner of violence, wholesome reading, while coming for the rough imagery in Toni Morrison's The Bluest Eye, which, by the way, I read as a kid while in Catholic schools, it's very difficult to take the substance of your complaints about age appropriateness seriously. Besides the fact that there's a segment of our population who is seeking to keep true, real-life history away from those who will be our future, the other thing is that book bans of this nature are just that next step closer to authoritarianism and fascism. There's not that far a leap from banning books to burning them. And as the Greg Locke demonstration and other similar ones show, We're already arriving at that point. Let's be completely honest. The right is not worried about indoctrination. They do not want freedom of thought or a diversity of ideas in the classroom. They want to literally keep actual knowledge out of the classroom. They want to keep children from learning our country's history in favor of their so-called patriotic history, meaning whitewashed propaganda, lies, and they want to keep children from possessing the language to describe their own realities or to understand the realities of others. They want an uninformed, historically ignorant, and permanently polarized populace so they can continue to restrict women's bodily autonomy, destroy voting rights for people of color and other marginalized groups, and pass other anti-democratic, authoritarian legislation without resistance. The sooner we understand that most conservative thought leaders, right-wing politicians, pundits, and their benefactors are not operating under a set of consistent ideological principles and seek power for their own benefit and to the destruction of others, the better we will understand the threat we face and the stronger we can respond. They are not worried about cancel culture or diversity of thought or divine truth or freedom of religion or freedom at all. They simply want to ensure that the only ones with power and control are themselves. If we do not take this threat to freedom and democracy seriously, and if we do not oppose it vigorously, banning ideas, banning facts, banning knowledge, Banning truth, banning books, burning books will lead to a frighteningly worse reality. Thank you very much for listening to Potstirer Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Amazon Prime, or on your favorite podcast app. Go to potstirerpodcast.com slash download, and you'll see the links to the podcast on a nearly endless list of podcast apps. If you subscribe for free, you'll be able to listen to new episodes once they come out. No waiting. Once it's posted, you'll have it. If you enjoyed the podcast, please go on your app of choice and leave five stars and a review. And I love to tweet quite a bit. So follow me on Twitter at PotstirerCast. I'm Jay Poole. Let's fight for America's future because freedom is not free.